Okay, welcome to this presentation on UI design for small screen devices. Um, this is one of the presentations on the green track, so we're not going to go too in depth. I just want to talk about basic principles that you can apply to any sort of application to make it more mobile friendly. And like uh, my, my sort of target audience is for people that are traditionally used to cute desktop applications and they just want to move over into the mobile space. So, to begin, first a little bit about me. My name is Jens Bakkevik. I have been a developer at Nokia Qt Development Frameworks in also for about five years, which means I started out in the company formerly known as Trolltech. Um, uh, what I've been doing in Qt Software is, among other things, I'm a specialist in sort of look and feel aspects. I'm responsible for the GTK integration in Qt at the moment. Uh, I've been working on the Qt Creator interface. And more recently, my focus has been on Qt Quick and QML. And I'm part of the Qt Components team. So, but I was not the one taking initiative for this talk. That was a good friend of me, Nigel Haytala. He's a principal user experience designer at Nokia. And he has more than 10 years of experience in doing mobile application design. And basically what he has seen is that on the OV store and out there, there's a lot of apps that make the same mistakes over and over again. So we have tried to compile a set of guidance that you can follow in order to make a truly great mobile app. So let's get started. Why would you want to develop a mobile app? Well, I'm pretty sure you already know this since you're sitting here watching this presentation. It's all about the apps. My take on it is you go back 10, 15 years ago. At some point, it became embarrassing for a company not to have its own web page. People just assume you have a web page, and that's where they look up to find information about your company. And we're seeing the same thing happening in the mobile space right now. People expect that you have an awesome, shiny-looking app available for your website, for your service, for your product. So we're not going to dwell too much on exactly why. Let's just talk about what makes a great mobile app. How can you make your app really stand out, really shine in competition with all the other apps out there in the marketplace? So before we can talk about great apps, we need to identify what are the core differences between traditional desktop development and mobile app development. So obviously, you can start with the screen size and orientation you generally have to develop a mobile app twice. It's essentially in horizontal mode and in vertical mode, especially Nokia phones have this feature built into them that they're designed for two different use cases. So that's one aspect you need to think about. It's of course the available resources. It's much less different now than it used to back in the day. I mean, you can run a full features office suit on your phones these days and it hardly stumbles. It has a gigahertz, it has hundreds of megabytes of RAM, but at the same time, it's also limited by battery. And this is what desktop designers don't usually think too much about. It's the input devices. You generally have to optimize for touch input these days, whereas if you come from a desktop environment, you can make tiny small buttons and you have incredible position because the mouse really is an excellent input device. It just doesn't work on a phone. And also keyboard access. And of course, the difference is in services. Uh, on a mobile phone, you have things like GPS built in, you have Bluetooth built in. You even have gyroscopes and compasses built in to current smartphones. So you really can make use of this. But what are the design characteristics of a typical desktop app? And how, does it differ, how is it different from a mobile app? Well, a desktop app tends to have a wide range of functionality. It tends to be flexible and configurable. And it tends to be used for long, sustained periods of time. And what I mean by that is you have a web browser running on your desktop. If you have a mail application running on your desktop, it just sits there. You, shut, you don't really shut down your computer. Many people just close the lid. They pop it open, open again, and it's still there. If you're working on Photoshop, it's really an environment that you have used for years. You become an expert, and you tailor the interface to your needs. You need to have toolbars that you can configure, and you need to have dockable widgets, and all of these things, or even windows inside your app that you can tweak to your, that you can tweak to your needs. All of this is lost in the mobile space. In the mobile space, you have to design for repeated use for short periods. You want power over flexibility. And I think a very good example of that is, how can I empower the user to put a picture up on Flickr, for instance? If you make a Flickr app, you should try to make it possible to post a picture within two key presses. It should really be no more than two key presses to get a picture on the page. If you add features in between, 
typical of what you see on the desktop is that you will ask the user for what size of picture do you want? Do you want cropping? Do you want things flipped? Do you want it horizontal? Don't nag the user about this thing. Just make it possible to, through two key presses, get that picture up on the website. And also, your app has to be obvious. People don't give your app a second chance. It has to be understood the first time, because you don't really ship a manual with your app. And generally, you see that mobile apps are more animated than front and desktop apps, and there is a good reason for that. Most of the mobile apps you have today are for entertainment purposes. You pick them up, you're a bit bored, you sit there for 10 minutes, you just want to read through some short list of snippets online. You want to play a game for like 10 minutes, you don't sit 10 hour sessions playing StarCraft II on your phone. That's not what it's designed for. So generally you see that apps have more design aspects, they're more animated, they're more vivid. And lastly, there is a different ecosystem. You have the app stores. It's much easier to compare bad apps to good apps. People give them ratings. If your app does not do the thing, the, the right thing immediately, people will just, it will just drop down in the marketplace. So you need to do it right the first time you publish it there. Um, a nice thing if you come from the desktop world is that the app store generally takes care of details, boring details like billing, like credit cards, and all of those things are automated for you. So that's the new ecosystem. So that's, that's, that's the differences in design and physical aspects. Now we're going to talk a little bit about how you can find the essence of your app, how you can really make it focused, how you can design for a small screen, how you take care of user input, and how you can do efficient animation. So let's talk about finding the essence for, first. What do I mean by that? I mean that a great mobile app is focused. Like I mentioned the Flickr, the Flickr example. Um, in a desktop app, you want to compete on features. In a mobile app, you want to compete on getting the core features right. So get the basics right, and don't worry about having more features than your competitors. Do not worry about having the same features that your equivalent desktop app have, because it's not how you can make a great mobile app. It doesn't hurt having features, but you will find that more often than not, the features you add will come at a price. The interface is just as important as the features. You want you expect more polish in a mobile app. And basically, um, we're going to come back to this in the design aspect. But uh, the main function should really be obvious to the user. So if you get core features right, and you just make the interface really look like a living application, if you, if you have like, uh, if you have a stock ticker application, you pick it up, you should just understand that this is a stock ticker application. It shouldn't, shouldn't just be a series of numbers. You want to make it really colorful and natural. So, okay. It's about finding the essence. Let's just find some concrete examples. Um, what's important in this app? A BBC newsreader. Let's have a look at the website. This is one of your typical drill down modes. You, you want to go from a fancy web page like this one to a more compact RSS feed like this one. This is pretty straightforward. You just design it as a list, and you rip down. You, you really don't want to give all the unnecessary details. You want to reduce the amount of ads, and this is pretty straightforward. I think most, this is how most mobile apps are designed. But it becomes more interesting when you're looking at a complex app like an IRC client. How many people here have used IRC clients? I would say at least half of you. So to those that don't know what IRC is, IRC is sort of the precursor of messenger clients, where actually it's slightly different. It's more like a chat room. It's a very old protocol. It used to be done through a command line interface. And actually, at our office, everybody online communicates through IRC. From the moment we log on in the morning to when we leave, we're always on IRC. And this makes it so efficient for us to communicate with each other without actually going and knocking on people's doors. And, and since I'm speaking of that, if you go on Freenode with the Qt Labs channel, you can find us as developers and you can talk directly to us all the time, not just here at Developer Days. We sit there, the channel is public, and I invite you all to just come in and say hello. But don't expect us to give you tech support because that's not why we're there. We're just there because we're nice. <laughs> so basically, what's important in this app for an IRC client? First, I'm going to show what's not a good way to do a mobile app. And I feel a bit bad about this because I use XChat. XChat is a great RC client for the desktop. But what we're seeing here is the initial version of XChat as it looked when it was 
first launched on the Miamo N900 phone. And I have used this myself because at some point it was the only app available. But you can see it has a lot of desktop isms. Um, the first most horrible thing I see here is, of course, the scroll bar. The scroll bar is not a good thing when it comes to mobile design. You expect flickable lists. And the other thing you see here, you have like all the people participating in the channel. But it's pretty useless in this case because you can only see the eight topmost names and there's like 300 names inside this channel alone. And on the left hand side is a very obscure form of a tab widget and there is only one tab. So why is it, why is it even visible? So this is an example of a pretty bad mobile app. The nice thing is that they released a new version and they addressed a lot of these issues. And this is a much more friendly, uh, in this case, more Miami tailored app. You can see we have the buttons, at the, bo the buttons at the bottom, which makes them immediately more accessible to your fingers. Uh, you see you lost the friends view, but at the same time, now I don't even know how, how I can access the friends view because it's not immediately obvious to me where it is. There is still, you can't see it, but there is still unfortunately a scroll bar. But to me, one of the biggest problems I have with this design is that it looks like a command line interface from the 80s. Would my mother use this? I'm pretty sure my mother would not touch this app. It looks horrible. And there are, there are some other interesting things, like the channel names are prepended with a small hash. And this is just because in the old command line syntax, you used to join channels by saying slash join hash channel name. So this is one of those command line interfaces that have leaked into the final app. So if I really wanted to drill down what is the essence of this app, the essence of this app is to focus on the conversation. So I made a quick mock-up. Actually, I made this last night. <laughs> but this is, this is how, unfortunately, all my nice shadows are dropped in this uh, projector. But this is, this is how you could really simplify it. And if you give this app to your mother, I'm pretty sure she can follow the same conversations because there is no reason to make a big, scary command line based interface. It could just look like any other messaging app out there. The only difference, it's chat room based as opposed to a direct messaging client. And right here, you can see the friends is immediately accessible. You just press this button and I expect friends list to slide in from the right hand side. So I'm not saying this is a perfect, beautiful final app. In fact, I haven't created it. So I'm sure we have to go through a couple of iterations before it will feel natural but it just shows the principle of drilling down to the essence, drilling down to the core feature set of the applications and getting those right before we add all the other features. So that was about finding the essence. Next thing I wanna talk about is a little bit on the design aspect. How can you design an awesome looking mobile app? Well, first of all, details matter. They matter more than they do for a desktop, quite frankly, because you have a smaller screen. So what you choose there have to be chosen more carefully. You have to start by removing clutter, remove anything that's unnecessary, and try to draw attention to the elements you can interact with, because quite often you see in interfaces, and I wish I could, I don't want to pick on any other applications right now, but there are a few I could mention. I'm going to leave those out. But if you, you basically want to draw attention to elements you can interact with, because the, the problem you can get if you don't do this is that people start clicking on things like toolbars that aren't really interactable. And another thing I see quite a lot with these drop-down flick lists is that they look like buttons because they have these nice bevels and they look pretty. And half of those lists you see bevels. But if you add bevels to your list entries and they're not really buttons, they don't really bring you anywhere, you're doing people a disservice. So try to create, in order to make it look interactable, try to create things that pop out using light and shadow and try to enhance the contrast on the button that are interactable. For instance, a label, you shouldn't have a strong, sharp, dark outline, but this button screams push me. It really does. It's a quite pretty button. I find it on the, I actually found this on the internet and with QML, it's just trivial to make these buttons in your app. Um, the other little subtle thing we see here is that when the button is sunken, we darken it. That's not really how light works in practice, but it's a very common clue to the user that it's now shifted inwards along the z-axis. So this is a nice example of a pushable button. You don't want to design your label like this. Another aspect you need to think about is guiding the user's attention with higher contrast. In this case, it actually becomes pretty horrible because on the projector, 
uh, you can't see this button. But on my screen, you can clearly see the OK button down there. So I think that sort of invalidated my example a little bit, because if you can't see that the bottom right there is a button, then my example falls apart. But you can imagine there being a distinct white button down there. And you can imagine this being the typical dialogue you put up in your wizard, your install wizard, where you have to sign a contract. It says, draw attention to this button, not to the text that's there. And this one says the exact opposite. It says the focus should be on the content. So the one on the left side there is the one you want to use where you are signing away your firstborn child by pressing that button. And the other one is the one you want to use if the focus is on the content. Again, unfortunately, because this projector doesn't handle the contrast that well, my example is not really that clear. So even though you have a small screen physically, white space is your friend. You should not reduce the amount of white space just because your screen is small. Because white space, it reduces eye strain. It improves the flow of your application. And I think the last part is maybe the most important. It makes your things look classy. And you will see this if you go to any famous design firm. You will see that they have these awesome looking logos. And they have a tremendous amount of space around them. Because it really boosts their egos. It focuses the center on what's in. It focuses your attention on what's in the center. And it really makes things look posh. And I'm going to show a concrete example of this. Um, on the left-hand side here, I would say you have the typical mobile app of the late 90s. I, see, I still see a lot of people designing apps that way. They don't really care about the white space. As you can see, there is almost exactly the same amount of text in both of these examples. The difference is here we add some space to enhance and really draw attention to the picture. And we just have caref more careful layout. But it's not like we fit less on the page. We just make it more pleasant to read. And another principle that I don't have an explicit slide on is that people in the Western society are used to reading from left to right. In fact, if you measure statistically, they will parse your page in an F pattern by reading topmost, then going further down, and then going less and less in depth. So put the most important content at the top, of course. But when I originally designed this slide, I actually read it the wrong way. I swapped the order of those two pictures and thought people would immediately understand which one I meant was the good one. But swapping the order really just added confusion because people expect the last item to be the correct one. Because quite frankly, we read from left to right. And this is maybe not so much on the design aspect. It's more on, the, uh, more on how you actually create your application. Try to use flexible layouts and anchors. Because uh, when you're designing for many devices, it's important that you can reuse your interface in several places. Um, and I can just show that how you do that in QML, for instance. If I can move my app over here. This is just so. In this case, I have your typical run-of-the-mill app. It's very basic. And again, the contrast kind of ruins it. That's the problem. When you do really sexy design, you tend to use subtle shades of gray. And when you put that on a projector, you lose all the aspects of that. So again, I, you can't really see it. But when I resize this application, you can see that the, uh, the buttons at the bottom and the toolbar at the bottom really follows the size of the screen. And in QML, what you would do is you generally create a root item that is the size of your mobile phone. In this case, I'm targeting some arbitrary mobile phone at 300 times 400 pixels. But everywhere else, I don't actually refer to those as anything but screen.width and screen.height. And the nice thing is that QML then always, your document will follow those patterns. So even if you have a wider screen, the relative size and sizes don't change. And all your anchors stay the same, because this one says center in parent, I mean, regardless of the size of the parent. So QML is really designed in a way to make it reflexible and scale. I'm not sure if that was a good save pitch for QML, but let's try that. So OK, try to use flexible layers and anchors. But even if you do that, you have to expect that you must make device-specific tweaks. Don't think that you can't create one the size that fits all. But this is precisely why we created QML, because it's so easy 
to take one QML file, make some adjustments, and ship a different QML file on a different device. It doesn't require a recompile. It just requires you doing some tweaks, changing the icons to a slightly higher resolution, and dump them on the phone. It's infinitely more flexible than it used to be back with C++ development. So here is another aspect I want to emphasize when you're on that topic. What's this? It's OpenOffice running on my N900. And again, I want to emphasize that the N900 is the most awesome phone I have ever had. I really, really enjoy it. But running OpenOffice on the N900 is not going to fly. It just shows that it doesn't really help to put more content. When you see this on the PowerPoint slide, it looks huge. But when I see this on my screen, forget about hitting any one of those buttons with your finger. Not even your pinky finger will be able to hit a single button in that interface or even the scroll bar. So what matters is physical size of the screen. It's not the pixel density. So don't add more content just because you have more pixels to add it to. Just show what content you have at a high resolution. And here I have like a nice example. The text stays the same size. You have one screen that has twice the resolution. Just make the text sharper. Just add high resolution images. Don't add more content because physically when you're designing, you should think of the phone as a piece of industrial design. Uh, your thumb has exactly the same size independent of the resolution of the screen. And this is, this is one problem I've seen, especially on the N900, because it has such a high resolution screen, people tend to abuse that. Uh, so develop on the desktop is very useful. Use the QML viewer. Um, target your, um, target, the, target the resolution of the phone that you want to design it on. But you have to design and test with the device. And if I get time, I'm going to show you exactly how easy it is to deploy on the, on the phone. But I'm going to do that at the end of the presentation when we know a little bit more what time, well, how much time we get left over. And this is really one of the strengths of Qt Quick. So that's what I had to say about design. Yeah. Next part is user input. And user input is the part that most people tend to get wrong, I think, when it comes to interface design. Because fingers are not mouse pointers. And these days, all the phones are navigated through touch. Fingers are less precise. You can't hover with a finger. So I've seen a lot of those awesome interface mockups in Flash. They don't quite work when you push them on the phone. Um, and fingers are, are generally more limited than, than your mouse is. I mean, you can't really do right clicks with your hand, can you? And here is a nice cartoon. I think a lot of people doing interface design have seen this cartoon before. It's from Lar Gary Larson. And it basically says, fumbling for his recline button, Ted unwittingly instigates a disaster. Because somebody put a wings stay on button right next to his recline button. And the thing is, like, we see the equivalent of this every day in interfaces out there. And of course, the equivalent of that is putting your email delete button right next to your email send button. People still do this. I don't know why. I'm just saying, please think about designing applications that make it hard to do mistakes, not easy. So that's the most important aspect. But people using finger input, they are bound to click the wrong button. So try to be forgiving. And by forgiving, I don't mean adding confirmation boxes everywhere to ask the user if he really wanted to press the button he just pressed. That's just like uh, when, when Windows added the trash can back in Windows 95, I remember deleting a file that would still ask, do you really want to delete this file? Whereas the whole purpose of the trash can was that you could still recover it. So I never understood why they had that extra confirmation. And I know especially Nokia has really optimized the way a lot of confirmation buttons on the phone lately, like on the N. Uh, on the N8, it doesn't ask you if you want to call someone. It just calls someone, and then you can still cancel it within, within like a second if you accidentally hit the wrong button. So please don't be confirming users' action, but be forgiving. If you can, you can make an undo step or just make it easy to get back to the previous state. Avoid unnecessary text input. No matter how good screen touch keyboards have become, it's still pretty annoying to use them. At least I really hate that. In this example, it's a bit artificial. Uh, we have a web form, and you're asking people to enter the gender by text. Of course, you would never see that in practice. But you can see similar things happening. Like if you ask for dog occupation, it's better to drill down that in a list of maybe 10 items the user can choose from. And it's, of course, much easier to data mine those results later. 
So keep in mind that you minimize the amount of text input you're asking from the user. And a much more elegant way you could do this, if, if you have a restaurant app, don't have a field asking where he lives. Just use the GPS built into the phone and open up the local restaurants automatically. Just take away the whole idea of asking for text input. And I mean, you can still add it if that's not necessarily what the user wants, but by default, you should try to guess what the user wants. Another example, if you're making a cartoon site, you might want to set the gender to male by default. Because quite frankly, the gender is likely to be male for a cartoon site. If you make a dating site, that's not so smart because that will tell your users that all the other guys are men anyway. <laughs> so here's another one people don't think about when they're designed for mobile. Um, your hands cover a big area of the screen. In this case, I have a legally binding contract. I like that, don't I? And you have the accept button placed on top. Fingers and hands obscure the view. Don't place important information where your finger or hand is. And this is easy if you come from the desktop because you're used to putting small text labels under the icons in the toolbar. That doesn't really fly for a mobile app because, or, or even on a touchpad or anything because when you put your hands over that button, you want to see that label. So just think about it the other way around. Put the label on the left side, put it up, up on the top, but don't put the label under the button. Um, also, when you design for an app, you have two modes. Uh, when you design a mobile app, you tend to design it to both for one-handed operation and for two-handed operation. And you use them in slightly different contexts. Emphasize the one-handed use if you want to perform an action often. And a typical example of that is a phone making a phone call. I can make a phone call in two clicks using this phone. And it's immediately accessible to me just through the use of my thumb. Because the thumb can only reach about a third of the screen. It depends on the size of the device. In this case, I can actually reach two thirds of the screen, but it's not entirely comfortable. So this is also why it's important to always test on the device and also why Qt Quick makes this incredibly easy for you because you can test your prototypes directly on the device while you're developing them. You don't need tons and tons of C++ to get to that stage. So right now, uh, I'm holding the phone in my hand and my thumb can reach everything on the left-hand side. But if you have a uh, two-handed mode, you'll basically see that you can access them from both hand sides. And in this case, the typical use case is you put the status icons in the middle because this is the area that the user can't touch. So this is where you want to put anything that you don't often click on. So these are just subtle things that you need to think about. But there are things people often do wrong when they design a mobile app. You will also see that in all of the phones I know about, they tend to put buttons at the, bot the, the core buttons for accessing the operating system menus and stuff are at the button of the screen for precisely the same reason. And I think this one I can't stress enough. Be responsive. When you use apps, one of the most infuriating experiences I have is if I click on something and nothing happens. You just sit there, you're not sure if it accepted it, and what happens? Well, you see, you press it again, and then you press it again and again and again because you don't know if the phone understood your message or it didn't. And there are tons of apps out there in the marketplace that still do this wrong. So always react to the user input. It, it's, less, it's more important that the user knows that something is going on than that you manage to complete whatever operation it is immediately. And if you're doing something time consuming, please use placeholder animations. For instance, when you download an image, you want to see that little spinning thing hovering until the image is showing up. So always be responsive, always react to input, use haptics, show the button as pressed, and then do the time-consuming operation. So that brings us over to animation. Animation is something we have added and made really, really easy to use in Qt Quick. And there are a lot of pitfalls you fall in because we made it this easy. So I think the first thing I want to stress about animation is you should have a purpose before you decide to put an animation into your app. And typical purposes are guiding the user through transitions. And, and done right, if you, if you know the typical drill down view of an app where you have these screens, and you navigate through them by clicking an item, it slides over to the left, you click another item, it slides over to your left, you place a back button in the top right corner that points back 
in the opposite side of the animation. And it really helps the user because he will have an image of the app as being a continuous list of things. And he will understand that pressing the back button brings him back to where he was. So you, you guide the user by using sort of geometric locations inside his mind. He, he builds an image of how the app looks internally. So you can use animations for those, those purposes. And also, for instance, if you have, um, if you have a list popping in from the right-hand side, you, you put that on the right same side as the button. So it's really a subconscious clue that clicking that button brought up the list. And clicking it again will remove it. So that's, that's where you should use animations. You can use animations to draw, draw attention to the important things happening. For instance, if your app suddenly lo loses network connection, you want to tell the user. You want something popping up in his face and annoying him because his entire app is probably not functioning properly at that point. And it can also be to make the app feel responsive. As I already mentioned with the, with the input case, if you don't tell the user that something is happening, you're really going to frustrate them. So those are the cases where you should add animations. There are places where you should not add animations, especially the first one. Don't waste the user's time. What I tend to see in a lot of apps, or actually not, not, not that many apps, but I have, a, I have a good anecdote from back in the Qt 4.3 days. We had item views, and we introduced this tree view. And you can navigate each tree node. And you would have a beautiful, smooth animation that would pop up each root item as a separate entity. So every time you expanded a node, the items would beautifully unfold like a flower. And this looked really, really awesome. And I thought, yeah, let's use this in my application. And then I tried it for a little while, and it was pissing me off. Because it took half a second to complete each of those animations, and that was half a second I had to wait. So in order to expand the tree, I lit literally had to wait for 10 seconds. Now, the fix for this was actually quite easy. Those types of animations that block the user shouldn't take more than maximum a quarter of a second. Uh, I think the small animation that fades in the Windows menus when you expand them is like 160 milliseconds. I know this because when I did the Windows style, I had to time this precisely with a stopwatch. <laughs> that was back in the day. So really, if your animation is blocking the user from doing something productive, it's better not to have it. Or just make it subtle and fast. Because even if your animation isn't really blocking the user, even if you can click on it as it fades in, he's not going to do that. He's going to wait for it to complete. Because it's impossible for him to know that that item is functional. And the other thing is, of course, don't waste the battery. Like, you don't want an animated screensaver on a phone for a reason. Because you don't want it spending CPU cycles on doing something unproductive while you're not watching. So. Don't have things that are spinning in the background. If you think about the beautiful apps out there in the marketplace, they generally are clean and calm. The animations only are there when the user interacts with it. It shouldn't be in your face. It's like the equivalent of the blink tab tag on web pages if you keep adding things that spin and shine in the background. So that's the, that's the other aspect here. Do not overdo it. Just be careful. Make them subtle. Good animation is only good when people don't notice it. You really only notice the lack of animation for a good app. And I can show you an example on how you can really make good animation. A good animation should be smooth. Jerk, jerk animation generally distracts a lot. And I've seen this. It's actually better to have a constant frame rate at 15 than one that goes from 60 and drops down to 10. So when you're doing an animation, try not to have too much stuff going on in the background. And and the other thing about making a smooth animation is that if you think about animation in a, um, back in like the PowerPoint era, at least a couple of years back, all the animations tend to be really linear and mechanical. And the first, when you, when you make your app, people tend to do this mistake. They just animate something. I want to slide in a view. I do a linear animation from left to right because it's so easy. So it just slides in like this. And then slides out. And that's not a smooth animation. Because animations in real world application, animations in the real world are not like that. They're always curved, they're always softened. When I drop this on the floor, gravity will make it accelerate. It goes faster in the end than it does in the beginning. So all natural animations are like that. 
And what Qt Quick allows you to, and not just Qt Quick, the Q animation framework, if you're writing through pure old widgets, is trivially to add this kind of polish to your app. This is, in fact, the whole reason you want to do an animation framework and not doing these things yourself, because it's actually a little bit of an effort to get this right. So I'm just going to show this as an example. Now I'm going to, um, yeah, this is my app. I'm going to change this over. I'm going to. And I'm going to change it so you can see what's on my screen. Beautiful. So this is Qt Creator. This is the tool you are likely to use if you're writing Qt Quick applications. And I'm sure you're going to see this tons of time during this dev days. So here is my app. And when I first launch this, I'm going to remove the animations because I want you to see the difference. And I'm going to give it 300 milliseconds. So there you go. This is my app. Well, if I actually don't have a syntactical error. This is my app. And you will recognize this as uh, the mockup I did for the RC application. And as you can see here, I have a nice little animation popping in from the side. And to most of you, that's probably OK. This looks pretty good. In fact, I would say. It's almost done. I mean, I have two animations going on. I'm fading out and I'm sliding in. But if you add an easing curve, it basically adds to the quality feel of your app. And I'm going to show you how easy it is to add an easing curve. Like in QML, all you have to do when you do an animation, you do an easing type, and you choose any one of these easing curves. And I showed only three of them on my slides. But there's literally, there's like 20 or 30 ones you can choose between. And I think you can even add ones yourself. So let's see how this looks if I do use an out cubic one. And so here's the old one. It's pretty good. And here's the new one. See that? It just instantly feels more natural. It really, really adds a level of quality that you don't, as a user, you don't notice it. Most users won't be able to tell that it's softened out like that. But at least to me, this really adds to the quality feeling of the app. These are the small details that matter if you really want to make your app shine. And I need to swap back to my extended view. Oh, great. Yeah, let's keep doing it like that. So. That's really about animations. Oh, I think we have a technical difficulty here. This always happens, doesn't it? Yeah. So concluding remarks is that mobile app design is really different from desktop design. You really need to keep your app focused. Find those key areas where your app really is supposed to deliver in and polish those. Compete on making those few great features proper. Make them better than your competitors. And then think about adding features later. And last but almost most important is that you have to test on a real device, because you have to iterate these interfaces several times before you can get a feel for how, how well it actually works in practice. And I'm going to demonstrate uh, tomorrow. I'm going to write a QML app from scratch. That's going to be my presentation on, on prototyping with QML. So I'm just going to show you all the steps from doing the Photoshop mockup to making a prototype. Type. And if I get time for it, I'm going to complete the whole app on stage. So that's going to be performance art programming, something I've never done before. So, but I really believe that Qt Quick is going to make app development that much easier. I think Qt Quick is really going to make the whole Nokia app market space explode. Because so far, I think one of the biggest problems with doing Nokia development has been it's been hard to get shiny apps out there. And we have really, really made that easy now. So um, are there any questions?
can somebody send the microphone to this guy? Well, is there something special that you have to think about um, for people that use is mainly left hand? Again, it's not something special you have to think about. I mean, now, now you're asking me personally if I think it really makes a difference. Of course, the thing is like if you have a device, you test it. That's all there is to it. If you, if you're, you just put it in your left hand and see if it works. In fact, I can still make phone calls with my left hand. I can make phone calls with my right hand. It doesn't really matter as long as you try it on the device. So I can't really personally not give you a much better answer than that because uh, as I mentioned, Nigel would be the interface expert at Nokia. So I'm not gonna really comment too much on that. What I can comment on is more about Qt Quick, how we can do it app development using Qt Quick and what the possibilities are. So feel free if there's any other question related to my presentation. Uh, if anyone's interested, I can demonstrate how easy it is to actually deploy on the phone um, later. But if there's not, then I think, yeah, there's a guy over here. Um, everything I've seen from Qt Quick now, it's quite free what you do and what colors you do it. Yes. Is there a style guide um, that Nokia uses for its devices? Yeah, that is a very good question. And it's something I was a little bit careful not to mention too much about, for obvious reasons. The thing is, we are, we are working on Qt components right now. And the idea of Qt components is to deliver pre-built widgets to QML and Qt Quick. Uh, Qt Quick right now is completely free form. It's like a blank canvas. I find it incredibly powerful and it's really, really easy to make beautiful interfaces. The way you would do it right now, if you don't have those things, you would just use PixMaps that resemble Symbian phones, you would use MyEmo, or you would download a pre-made uh, widget gallery for that because it really is almost trivial to make a button and a slider in QML. It's just a matter of hooking up PixMaps. So yes, it's entirely free form and it's entirely based on PixMaps. But we are working on a solution and it will be presented, some of that will be presented tomorrow in the talk by Leo, uh, Qt Components, where we'll present at least a uh, rough sketch where we standardize what buttons look like, what sliders look like, and you can also have downloadable themes connected to them. So we are working on a solution to deliver that. But I would have to say that if you as a third party developer, now I'm talking about my personal experience, doing an app that tries to blend in natively with all the devices out there is difficult. Sorry, <laughs> it's, it's actually difficult because um, it really makes it, you have to target so many different variety of apps. So you see that polished apps, sometimes they just tend to design their own interface from the ground up. And as long as you're internally consistent in your app, I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing, but do follow the user interface guidelines because they are written down. If you target the Miami phone, there's a hundred page document you can go in and see exactly what people expect from a button. But you're right, we are, we are working on delivering that. If you want a native looking application using QML, right now there is no direct solution for it. But there will be within, we will have a prototype within a couple of months, I think. And then you could start using it. And then you will have buttons that natively blend into Symbian, that natively blend into Migo, and possibly that blend into desktop environments. Yeah. Um, <coughs> you're First of all, thanks for the presentation. It seemed to focus very much on touch devices, but uh, I mean, I know it's a, a big, yeah, it's a, a big concept. But what about non-touch devices? Are there any, I mean, specific points you would like to highlight uh, for targeting non-touch devices in terms of for non-touch devices? Um, not really. I mean. In most cases, it's completely transparent to you as a user. If you have a keyboard on the phone. Or are, are you mean pure desktop development versus mobile development? No, not desktop. Or phones no, that have, oh, yeah, you're thinking like about third, like third edition devices. Keyboard navigation? No, no like E72, like, like those kinds of devices, E72, like QRT devices. Yes. Yeah. So um, not really. I mean, in, in the case of both the N97 and the case of the N900, the QWERTY keyboard, keyboard comes in addition to an on-screen keyboard. I mean, the only difference to you as a user is that you can type it in physically 
the interface to QML is really not any different. You generally don't have, uh, but you generally want to enable focus flashing, for instance, in an element. And that's just a matter of setting a flag. I mean, if you click on something and it has keyboard focus, a cursor will flash telling you that it has focus. I think that's a direct thing you have to design for in your app. And by default, QML does enable a small blinking cursor. If you, if you have a pure touch device, you don't need that really because, yeah, it depends on the device. Uh, there is another thing, I mean, we're, we're still working with Qt components to see if you can have a better interface for virtual keyboards, for instance, so you know where the virtual keyboard is on screen, and then you can tell whether or not you want to slide the app up and down. But again, no, I don't think there is any uh, particular thing you have to design for when you do with non-touch devices. But if you want to do pure desktop development, you generally want to write a completely different application, I think. Yeah. Thanks. There's a guy sitting there. Um, you mentioned it, um, especially with the, uh, virtual keyboards, how is um, um, Qt Quick act when the virtual keyboard comes up and hides the text field I'm entering? Is it moving itself up, for example, like Apple does? At the moment, um, hmm, can I demonstrate that? Um, for the N8, it really isn't a question because the virtual keyboard always covers the screen on the N8. On the N900, it will, it actually depends on your particular device. It's up to the device to decide what happens with the content area. In general, the virtual keyboard on the N8, it, it covers the entire screen. So it's not really an aspect you have to design for with this device in mind. But I think in a firmware update, it might be that they introduce that. But it's really up to the developer. Um, Right now, the plan is to extend that as an option. We have in the Qt components, we have an interface for the virtual keyboard, and we want to provide the area of the virtual keyboard for you to control. So it really becomes up to the platform guidelines of the particular device, which path you want to go through. But you can expect there to be a default behavior that you generally don't control. So it should happen automatically for you, but yes. Anything else? There's a guy over there. Hi. Um, I just had a question about uh, being able to distribute QML apps, like, for example, on Nokia Store, Obi Store. Um, like non-QML, just Qt applications you can distribute with the smart installer. Yeah. Uh, QML apps, when and how would we, would we be able to do that? Mm. Uh, the N8 ships with Qt 4.6, which means it doesn't really have Qt on the device. And right now, the smart installer doesn't install on it because of that, because there are apps on this that depend on Qt. But in, there will be a firmware update on this that introduces 4.7, to my understanding. I don't know the specific dates, but I know it will be pushed out in the marketplace. And as soon as you have an option to install 4.7 on it, it will, base, it, it will just be there. But the thing is, we will not ship the QML viewer as a distributable. So if you want to make a QML app, you have to make a C++ wrapper. The nice thing is that Qt Creator and the Nokia SDK is going to come with this functionality built in, so you don't really have to think about it. But right now, the policy is we don't really, you don't really ship pure QML. The idea is that you use QML for the interface components in addition to your existing C++ backend. But I don't really see any, uh, any problem with shipping a pure QML app in the future. So um, does that answer your question? So if you agree. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to know if you know the timeline for the uh, 4.7, basically, uh, when we'd be able to uh, ship QML applications uh, embedded in C++, obviously, as well. Unfortunately, I don't know the okay. timeline. There are too many other factors that depend on that. So I mean, I know that I'm running Qt 4.7 on this N8. It works beautifully and it's super smooth. So if you're interested in seeing it in action, you can just come over to my stand after the presentation. Okay. So uh, and I, I would expect this to be possible to start develop on within a couple of months, maybe. And then, then everybody will be, able, will be able to download this for their N8. But to have the, the automatic install from Ovi Store, uh, it's outside my department. I don't really know the deploy story there. 
If there's anyone, any other trolls in here that are capable of answering that, it would be great. Unfortunately, there isn't. But we are going to make, uh, just to say, there are going to be quite a lot more cute quick talks later. So you will have the opportunity to ask this question again and again. And I would highly recommend going to Roberto Raga's introduction tomorrow. And uh, possibly also my, uh, my presentation where I'm going to write the whole app from scratch, just showing how easy and flexible it is to write QML apps. So yeah. How are we doing time-wise? Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, there's one guy over here. You advised us to focus on the application, but what happens if I have, if I do have an application which is complex and in which I need to offer a lot of functionality? Or how would you keep, for instance, the menus clear or the application structure? Do you have any advice on that? Um, you're basically asking if you have a complex app. The question, my question then is why do you have a complex app on the phone? I mean, what is the intended use case of that app? It's, it's, it mm. should be, I'm, I'm, yeah. I Maybe mean, because you uh, focus on uh, expert or on uh, technical, it's, it may be a technical application and not yes, just... Uh, yes, yes. Uh, when I talk about making great mobile apps, I'm primarily thinking about mass market. How can you sell this app to your mother? How can you get 20,000 views in the app store? You don't do that by making a highly technical app. If you have a highly technical app, it means you're going to have a skilled workforce who are willing to put in time and effort in learning your app. At that point, uh, having this obvious interface is, of course, not as important. Um, it's sort of a different use case. But I mean, if you do that, still you have to drill down what's the most important aspect of your app. If it's a medical app that you walk around on a hospital and you take notes with it, you should make the taking note part trivial. And it doesn't mean you can't have pop-down menus with complex functionality, but that is no excuse for having all the features on the front page of the app. Really, I'm, all I'm talking about is like drilling down, use context-sensitive menus, don't have configurable menus, but just drill it down, find the core use cases, and make those great. I think that applies even if you have a highly technical app. I'm not saying that features by themselves is bad. I'm saying the core features should be easy and power the user. Power over flexibility, basically. Yes? I think if there are any... Oh, there's one over there. Yeah, we have to wait for a microphone, basically. So, uh, for example, Ample has a pretty good human interface guidelines document. Yes. Um, Android doesn't have one. How it's with Nokia and all Nokia the has three. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, well, Nokia does have user interface guidelines. There is one for the Maemo. There will be one for Migo. I, I think it's already available out there, and it's definitely one for Symbian. And you will see that the guidelines you have between both Apple and Symbian are going to be almost the same. It's like that with all user interface guidelines because they're basically documenting sane behavior. And it's not like we're trying to make insane behavior. So um, the thing is, in, in, it, there is a chance that in the future you might have to choose which platform you target. But the nice thing is like, we are developing Orbit on one side, we are developing Migo on the other side, or when I say Orbit, I mean we're developing Symbian versus Migo, but we are aligning the guidelines to a level where at least you can deploy to both platforms and not have the users confused. But unfortunately right now, if you're asking me, do you have to design your app twice? My answer is yes, you probably will have to do it. But if you use QML, the difference, the things you have to change in your application is not that much. Really, you can, you can write the QML interface from scratch in a couple of days if you already have a good working copy. It's so easy. There is no deployment. There is only copying the file and directly run it on the device. So you don't have to recompile your app even. You can even do the interface and just send it purely to the designer. So we're doing QML because it's easy to make multiple interfaces. And precisely because the develop once, deploy everywhere doesn't quite work in the mobile space because of all of these differences. So don't expect to have a one-size-fits-all solution. We cannot deliver that, but QML makes it much less painful to develop twice. 
I think is my answer to that. So I think that covers what we can do for this session. If anyone is interested in just asking questions, just come to me afterwards. And that's it. Thank you.